Hey everyone, Pallav here and welcome back to iCode. In this video, we will see MVI architecture, something that's been popping up everywhere in the SwiftUI world. It is definitely a very important architecture and you must get a good grip on it if you want to make your life easy with SwiftUI. If people around you are discussing MVI, words like reducer, store, effects, etc. Don't worry, we'll understand it inside out today. And if you have been on this channel before, you know that we don't just touch the surface. We understand the topics in detail. When Swift UI came out, it changed the way we think about UIs. Instead of saying that do this, then update that, then pass this information somewhere and then update the UI. Instead of thinking like this, we started saying that here's how my UI should look like for this state. Everything started working around states. Because that's the thought process of declarative UI, right? Our UI is the function of the state. When the state changes, UI changes. Simple. So we trained our minds and started thinking in terms of states. But when the UI world changed, our architectures did not. Not immediately at least. We kept using MVVM. Why? Because it worked well with UIKit. And it worked with SwiftUI too. So as far as I have seen, this was fine till the POC stage. When you are onboarding with SwiftUI or, or maybe in some small apps. But when we tried using MVVM with SwiftUI for larger applications, applications having multiple modules, complex screens, where view model contains multiple published properties, async tasks, we started facing some challenges. Okay, I'll be honest here. I'm not against MVVM. I have worked a lot on MVVM and I must say that it was a great improvement over MVC. We moved business logic out of the view, separated concerns, and it all felt clean. But if you are using MVVM with Swift UI and your app grows, you will see the problems. The view model getting overloaded with the published properties, you are juggling multiple async tasks, fetching data, showing loaders, handling errors, and one publisher updates another, and suddenly you are asking yourself, wait, who changed this state and why? And that's the biggest problem. States become unpredictable. Multiple things can modify it. So you have to trace through the combined pipeline to debug and it's not very easy. And as you add more screens, view model gets more complicated, it becomes even tough. So the clean structure we started with, it slowly turns into spaghetti. And there comes MVI. Unlike Viper, we don't mention all the components of MVI in the name itself. There are a few more other than just the model view and intent and we'll discuss them about in a few minutes. But for now, let's just understand that MVI architecture brings a unidirectional data flow, a single source of truth for your UI. Okay, let me help you visualize it. The view sends intent, and these intents are nothing but the user actions. Those intents go to a store which acts like a brain. The store passes them to a reducer, the reducer decides how the state should change basis on the intent. And then the reducer returns a new state and the view simply renders itself from that updated state. That's the basic idea. Please be with me. We'll understand this in detail. I promise. Right now, I'm just giving you the idea that it's unidirectional flow of data. Publishers are not firing randomly from anywhere. Now you might be thinking that, that it's okay maybe some more modularization, maybe something different, a new architecture. But how is this making sense with SwiftUI? Why should I specifically choose this MVI for SwiftUI projects? Now here's the beauty. SwiftUI itself is already unidirectional by design. It says that your UI is equal to the function of your state. So if your architecture also follows that same principle, your code will become predictable and testable. It will be clean. Every view depends on a single piece of state and every change in that state goes through a reducer. So there's no magic, no two-way data bindings, no surprises. It's like having one-way traffic and of course it will reduce the accidents. Now let's understand MVI in detail. Starting with the view, this is exactly how it was in MVVM. Your Swift UI view, nothing changes there. Next, the model. This is also same as in MVVM, the domain entities. For example, a restaurant, a user, booking, that's the model. And in MVI, these models are contained in the state. So then comes the state. 
This represents the current truth of your screen. It includes models and UI flags like is loading or selected tab. Think of it like a snapshot of what the screen looks like right now. Then comes intent. Intents are user actions, things like tabbed increment, pull to refresh, selected some item, submitted some form. They describe what the user wants to do and not how it is done. The intent of the user, the action performed, that's the intent. The next component is reducer. The reducer is the decision maker. It takes the current state and intent as parameters and returns a new state. Along with the updated state, it can also return some effects. Now what's this effect? I'm repeating, we'll understand all these in code. It will be even more clearer there. But for now, just understand that effects represent something that is outside the pure Swift world. Like network calls, file reads, maybe delays, notifications. So reducers never directly call APIs. They just return an effect saying, hey, we need to fetch the data. Then store executes it. So that way, reducer returns two things, updated state and the effects. It's like I have updated the state to loading and now we need to fetch the data. And the last component is store. The store is like the conductor of all this. It holds the state, runs the reducer when an intent comes in, executes effects and publishes the new state for the view to render. In terms of Swift UI objects, store is the observed object. It's basically the glue between everything. Now let's look at the flow. When any action is performed, the intent is passed to the store. The store then sends the current state and the intent to the reducer. The reducer updates the state, checks if anything else should be done other than the state updation and returns the updated state and the effect back to the store. Remember, reducer itself does not perform that action. It returns it as an effect. Then the store executes that returned effect and with the updated state, view gets updated. I hope that at least theoretically this is clear now. Now for translating this to code, we'll see an extremely simple example, a counter application. It's a very simple example and best for understanding the architecture. It will have a screen that, that shows a count some buttons for incrementing, decrementing and resetting the count and we'll also add a button to increment the count with some delay. I'm adding this delay button on purpose to show that how effects work. We'll see that how the intent flows through the store, how the reducer updates the state and how the view just renders it. It's clean and very predictable. And once you understand the architecture in this simple project, you'll be able to scale it up to real projects. So let's see it in Xcode now. So here's our project for the counter application and let's look at the files first. We have one for the intent, one for reducer, one for state, then store and the view. The effect has been mentioned in the reducer itself, but you can pull it out to a separate file if that is required. So let's look at the, the view first. That will help you in visualizing that how it is going to look on the screen. So we have a text here. Here we are going to show the count. And then there's a progress view for showing the loading state. And then there are some buttons, nothing much here. A button for incrementing, decrementing and resetting the count. And uh, then there's this button for incrementing it with a delay of two seconds. As I mentioned, I have added this increment with delay functionality on purpose to show you that how effects work, how effects come in action. We'll see that. Now let's look at the intents. As we discussed, intents are the actions that user can perform. So in this counter intent, we have increment, decrement, reset, increment after a delay, and then did finish the increment. You will understand this when we'll go through the effects part. Now let's look at the reducer, that what reducer is doing here. As we discussed, reducer is responsible for updating the state and returning the effect if it needs to. In some cases, it may not be required. In some cases, it may be required. So let's see. So here we have a switch on the intent and if the case is increment, decrement or the reset, we are just updating the state, we are not doing anything else. But if the intent is for incrementing it after a delay, we are updating the state, the is loading property to true and then we are creating an effect for returning it. In this effect, we are saying that after two seconds, initiate a new intent that is did finish increment and then this new intent will be executed by the store again. 
You will understand this when we will run the application. So essentially we are updating the state here and then returning the new state and the effects. That's what we discussed that the reducers take state and the intent as the parameter and return the updated state and the effect as the return type. So that's our reducer, a pretty simple one. We do have an effect in the effect. We, we don't have much. We just have a closure here. The intents we already discussed and now in the state. So in this case, the state is not having the model. And this is because this is a pretty simple example but essentially the state holds the model. So in the real world applications where models are of course required, they are stored in the states. In this case, maybe we can consider the count as our model, although it's, it's a primitive data type, but it's okay for understanding. So we have our state here and it is having one of the UI flags as we mentioned, uh, it is loading here. That's the state. And the last thing, the store. The store which works as the conductor, which is the glue for all of these things. So it has, a published property that is the state the view will be listening to this state only and once the state changes the view will update accordingly so that's our published property then we have a reducer here we do have a map of cancelables this is just for cancelling the effective that is required let's say you move from the screen and you want to cancel some async task that was going on that screen we can of course do that if we track it in the in, in this map of the cancelables then there's initializer and then this is the function the send function this will be responsible for getting the intents from the view so this function will be taking the intents and will be passing it to the reducer for further processing so let's see what's happening here it it calls the reducer reducer is purely a function it calls the reducer sends the current state and the new intent the two things that the reducer requires the current state and the intent these two things are passed to the reducer and it returns a tuple of a new state and the effects we saw that effects may not be required always in some cases maybe it will make sense in some cases maybe it will just return an empty array so after we get the new state and the effects from the reducer first of all we just update the state and then if the effects are returned we will execute them in a loop so here we are just running a loop on the effects and then we are we are executing the effect so in our effect we saw that there was a run method so basically we are just executing the closure that is returned as an effect from the reducer so that's our store that is all about it and as we discussed that the view that is holding the store as an observed object i mentioned this that in terms of swift ui objects store is an observed object so the complete flow will go like this when user will tap on any of the buttons the intent will be sent to the store this send method will pass the current state and the received intent to the reducer. The reducer will update the state accordingly. So here's our reducer. Basis on the intent received, it will update the state and then it will return the updated state and the effect back to the store. So once this returns back to the store, we update the state, of course on the main thread and then we execute if there was any effect returned. This is how it will work. Now let me run it and let's see this in action. So let's first try incrementing it. The flow would be working as we discussed, but when you try this, please put the breakpoints and see that how the intent is being passed and how that entire flow is getting executed. But yeah, so you would have understood that how this increment, decrement and resetting will work. Now let's try this increment after two seconds and let's see that how effects come into the play. So if you see here, the flow got stuck at this breakpoint and that is because we have received one value in the effects. In the return from the reducer we got an effect which needs to be executed now the state has been updated before this point so the screen will be showing the loader and now this effect will be executed asynchronously for whatever needs to be done essentially it will be calling this send method again recursively for the new intent that has been received but let's try playing this and let's see that the loader is being shown or not so let me just play this and you see that there was a loader over there Okay, let me run it again without the breakpoint. Okay, so let's try this. You see that this loader is being shown and now the count got incremented. This is because the state got updated first. Essentially, the reducer returned two things. One was the state for updating the UI and then the second one was the effect that what needs to be done after that. So in this loop, this effect got executed asynchronously. Now this effect can be any of your asynchronous tasks, be it a network call, 
or reading from database or updating the file or anything for that matter. Precisely the idea is that the reducer will return the effect, it will not execute it itself. The store will execute the received effect. So that's how the MVI architecture works. I hope you got a gist of it. And for the reference, I'll put this code on the GitHub and we'll mention the link in the description. So now that we have seen MVI in action, we can compare it with MVVM. And if there are any questions remaining on why should you choose MVI for Swift UI, this will answer those. First, the state management. In MVVM, it is implicit and scattered. There are so many published properties and it can create a mess. Instead, in MVI, it happens from a centralized place. There is just one structure responsible for that. Next, the data flow. So with MVVM, we generally set up the two-way data binding. It's bi-directional, but in MVI, it's unidirectional. The view passes the intent, store passes that to reducer, and reducer updates the state, and that way, the view gets updated. It's pretty sorted. Next, the predictability. Honestly, it's a little difficult in MVVM to trace the cause. But if you compare that with MVI, it's pretty easy because every state change has an explicit intent. You can trace the entire flow. And this makes the debugging easy. In MVVM, the state change can happen from anywhere. In fact, update on one published property can update another one. In MVI, only reducer is responsible to update. So it's pretty deterministic. And with this level of modularization, of course the testing becomes easy. In MVI, the reducers are pure functions. They're very easy to test. So personally, I see MVI as a clear winner when it comes to complex applications in SwiftUI. But having said that, we must take care of a few things, otherwise MVI can also become equally messy. First of all, don't make reducers call the APIs directly. Keep them pure. Effects should handle that. Next, you should try to keep your state lightweight. It should only include what the view needs. Don't bloat it. Don't add unnecessary stuff to it. Also, don't overdo the MVI for tiny components. If your view is static and simple, MVVM would work well there. Don't push MVI unnecessarily just for the sake of using it. And most importantly, log your intents and states during the development phase. You'll be surprised to see that how easy the debugging becomes. So that brings us to the end of this video. And I would suggest that if you are building your next Swift UI app, maybe start with MVI and you will thank yourself later for that. So that's all for today. And now as an assignment, I would suggest you to try MVI in an app which is having multiple modules. Of course, you'll face some challenges. You'll think that maybe you should have multiple reducers in a store or should you have multiple stores for multiple modules? So let me give you an idea on this. Your store should have only one reducer. It can be a nested one though, as in it can have sub reducers. But about the multiple stores, try making a composite store at the app level. It can have dedicated stores for each module, but try to have at the app level. So give it a try and let me know in the comments. If you want me to make a video on MVI in slightly complicated app, having a few modules, put it in the comments and I'll try to do that. So that's it. If this video gave you some clarity on MVI, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. For more such videos, consider subscribing. I'm Pallav, this is iCode and as always, Keep learning, keep building and keep the things crystal clear. Happy coding.